shows, and we've been trying to talk to the actual experts here. One of them is the uh, former lieutenant in the U.S. Navy, Ryan Graves. So let's put this up there on the screen. He writes in Politico, quote, we have a real UFO problem, and it's not balloons. And Ryan recounts some of his own interactions with uh, anomalous aircraft or objects, whatever you want to call them, that were up in the air. And he's been trying to draw attention to this increasingly on his own podcast and in the public. So we are very happy to have you on the show, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me here. So, Ryan, what did you want to accomplish whenever you were writing this article, whenever you started your podcast, trying to bring as much attention to the UAP, UAP phenomenon? You've been one of the most outspoken former pilots who's actually interacted with some of these things. Why, why are you choosing to do so? Why, why do you want to be in the public eye? Oh, well, uh, I'll push back and say I don't necessarily want to, but Fair. this was an issue that just wasn't getting the attention that it deserved. Uh, when I saw the 2017 New York Times article come out with the videos of um, various UAPs, uh, I recognized those videos. I recognized them. I heard the voices on them, and I was like, hey, I was there for those. Um, I also realized at that point that this was an issue that was still ongoing. I then reached back to my squadron mates who were still flying on the East Coast, and this was still an everyday aviation safety hazard for them. Wow. And I realized the proper mechanisms weren't being put in place to, to resolve this issue. And it was just a matter of time until there was a midair. Mm-hmm. Ryan, can you, just for people who uh, aren't familiar with you and the videos that you're referring to, can you just explain what you experienced and what you saw? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, I was a F-18 Foxtrot Super Hornet pilot, uh, which means I was uh, attached to the east coast of the United States, and I would operate off the eastern seaboard for a number of years in a, basically a training environment, not really a uh, combat environment. Um, however, while we were there, we started noticing objects when we upgraded our radars that weren't there, you know, just even on the previous flight with the older radar. And so eventually we started flying close enough to these objects for them to be picked up on our optical uh, forward-looking infrared camera system. Uh, and we started to uh, gain uh, visuals within the jet itself on those systems of those videos that you see, um, such as the gimbal video and Go Fast. Um, eventually, we saw these objects with our own eyeballs, uh, and at that time, we didn't have an explanation for what they were. They just simply looked like a, a black cube inside of a, a clear sphere. Hmm. Um, these objects would be up there all day. They would be either maneuvering around 0.6 to 0.8 Mach, which is around at the high end, 350 knots, um, or they would be completely stationary against the wind. Um, when you're up there, it's like being in the ocean. Everything is moving. So when you have uh, objects uh, that are stationary against high winds for uh, very long periods of time and then begin maneuvering, it's just something that we're not used to seeing. Uh, right. And, and we had uh, we were almost hitting these objects. We had them flying very close to our aircraft that were uh, requiring evasive maneuvering. Wow. Yeah. I mean, this is your testimony, uh, you know, before Congress and, and, and just publicly has been so important for highlighting how frequent of an interaction that this is. And uh, it's almost more stunning that we, ha- like you said, we haven't had an accident or that we haven't had more pilots come forward. One of the things that you write about, Ryan, in the Politico article is that the president did not talk about UAPs that exhibit advanced performance capability. You say, where is the transparency and urgency from the administration and Congress to investigate highly advanced objects in restricted airspace? Space that our military cannot explain. And you talk about a new organization that you are starting and an initiative to try and gather as much data as possible. You want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, and so that's a natural uh, progression of the work that's been going on trying to bring attention to this. Uh, we've seen that one of the main uh, movers of attention on this topic is on Capitol Hill with the senators and Congress people that have been uh, mandating action from the Department of Defense. Uh, to investigate this topic. And within the aviation um, um, ecosystem, I'll say within the United States, it really does take a, a, an act of Congress to move anything. And so I founded the Americans for Safe Aerospace, which is a very simple organization. We think that we should know what's above our heads. Uh, and those are going to likely fall into two different categories. They're either going to uh, end up being some type of adversarial threat platform, and it's a national security issue. We have, uh, we have the systems to prosecute those targets. Or if we don't know what they are, it's a matter for scientific curiosity. And I bet when we start narrowing down that bucket of anomalous objects, more security threats could fall out, but we'll continue to make that bucket smaller to try to figure out what these objects are. Mm-hmm. The American for Safe Aerospace is going to be looking to push policy and legislative action to ensure that uh, air crew and pilots, both uh, military and commercial, 
uh, I feel comfortable reporting this so that we can continue to expand the conversation. And Ryan, what did you make of these uh, recent objects that were shot down? Obviously, one of them was a Chinese spy balloon. Don't really know what the other ones were. Uh, maybe potentially one of them was just like a hobbyist balloon. No debris has been recovered, and they seem to have abandoned any attempts to re recover whatever debris there was from these shoot downs. What did you make of all of that? Yeah, you know, it's it's a very confusing uh, series of events, which is what led uh, to me writing that political article back to the first question. Uh, there just seems to be a very confusing narrative around these objects. First, you know, if we think of how this uh, proceeded, there was a, a visual confirmation of, uh, of an object, of a balloon that it appeared uh, by um, civilians in the United States. Uh, that kind of ramped things up. Um, and this is public knowledge. Now, we seem to have slowed down the speed gates on some of our sensors, or at least brought to attention based off of the sighting of that balloon, what other slower speed objects could be in our airspace. Um, however, the communication was very clear that the first quote unquote Chinese spy balloon was a Chinese spy balloon. Right. Uh, and the other three objects are still unidentified uh, objects at this point. Uh, what was communicated was that they appeared to be more or less drifting in the wind, uh, which is not consistent with what we were seeing off of the Eastern seaboard. Uh, but I think it, you know, whatever the objects end up being, I think it just goes to prove the point that there are objects up there that we're not aware of. Some of them are gonna fall out and be adversarial programs. Uh, some of them uh, might be completely prosaic. Uh, and there are another category of them that we can't necessarily call prosaic due to the behaviors that they're exhibiting. And I wrote that article to ensure that that wasn't lost in the fray uh, so that we didn't start assuming that everything unidentified in our airspace uh, ends up being a balloon. But to that point, for those uh, hard skeptics that like to say, well, they're probably just balloons, I think now the American people see that that's actually a pretty serious issue as well, both for national security and for aviation safety. Uh, and, you know, it goes all the way to the top. So we, we just can't be complacent with what's above our heads. And the ASA is going to push uh, for action to ensure that's the case. Good. And one thing I want to get with you, Ryan, uh, I hear this from the critics all the time, which is it's pilot error. These guys, you know, they have no idea what they're seeing up there. They're mistaking it for, uh, you know, reflection or something like that. Can you talk about, you joined the Navy in 2009. Lay out for the audience how much training familiarity with your equipment, familiarity with normal objects in the sky that you encounter, and your ability to determine what is anomalous and what is not while you are flying an aircraft you've probably flown for thousands and thousands of hours. Certainly. So these these aircraft, you know, I'll even not even refer to the F-18 as an aircraft. It's a weapon system designed to do uh, very particular mission sets. And those mission sets are really based around two objectives. Uh, one is to be able to identify what's out there and be able to tell who's friendly and who's not, and also to identify the ones that we're not certain about uh, and work to identify whether they're friendly or not, and then to prosecute the targets that are not friendly. Um, and we prosecute those targets that are not friendly primarily by flying close enough to be within weapons range uh, and also far enough away that we're not too much in their weapons range. So controlling the distance off the nose of our aircraft and knowing who's who is essentially the primary responsibilities of our job. Everything else is mechanics to prosecute those targets. Uh, we call that uh, correlation while we're flying up there. So the suggestion, you know, and so all our tools, to go to your point, so our training is mm -hmm. to learn how to use the incredible tools that we have in those, in those weapon systems. And those weapon system tools include radar, uh, electro-optical cameras, uh, other electronic warfare systems and um, electrical uh, tools for um, understanding electromagnetic spectrum around you. And we take that information and we share it. And we sh that information gets pumped out and we get a combined image of what's in the area. And so when we say we see something out there, um, whether it be on our, our radar or our electrical optical systems or some other uh, device, um, that information is being correlated across multiple sensors uh, and all that technology that we have and that we've trained to use is telling us that it can't be identified. And not only can't be identified using the interesting mechanisms we have, but also it's not behaving in a way that we recognize. Yes. Uh, and so all these things are telling us they're wrong. And yet these are the things we most highly train to do is to maintain the distance off our nose and to identify things. Um, and those are unfortunately two of the largest arguments used uh, to say we're incorrect. Mm-hmm. 
Very important. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but. Oh, it, it answers Absolutely. it very, very well. Uh, Ryan, uh, congratulations on starting the new organization. We'll have a link down there to all the description to your new podcast as well so people can find out about it. And you're welcome back on the show anytime uh, to discuss the topic. Really appreciate you joining us. Thanks for your time, Ryan. It was my pleasure. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely.